If there's a right way to do something, then there's usually a wrong way. Luckily, many tasks limit the effects of attempting something the wrong way. Unfortunately, landing is not one of those things. Mastering the normal landing, and especially the crosswind technique, is challenging. It is these challenges, however, that develop a pilot's decision-making and technique. With practice and experience, the aspiring pilot will learn to recognize and correct for these minor errors early. Undoubtedly, over the course of their careers, every pilot will encounter the numerous difficulties known as faulty approaches and landings. While this video will contain content on how to recognize and recover from a variety of situations, one cannot stress enough the importance of recognizing when to perform a go-around. Landings are not meant to be saved. With the immense number of variables present in any given approach, pilots are tasked with evaluating and correcting any changes that occur in the approach path. Generally, minor corrections are required. If at any time the approach becomes unstable, major corrections are required, or the pilot just feels like they should go around, an immediate go-around maneuver should be executed. While situations and errors during an approach and landing are truly infinite, analysis and experience has led the FAA to group some of the most common issues into the Airplane Flying Handbook. The fourth and final video in this series addresses hazards specific to crosswind landing techniques and describes specific crosswind landing errors to include touchdown in a drift or crab, ground loop, and the wing rising after touchdown. There are three different techniques for crosswind landings. These include the crab method, the D-crab method, and the side slip or wing low method. To successfully land from a crosswind, two conditions must generally be met. The flight path is aligned with the runway, and the longitudinal axis is also aligned with the runway. To align the flight path, the crab method relies on the use of thrust, point the nose into the wind. The side slip method accomplishes this by pointing lift into the wind by using bank. The finale of aligning the longitudinal axis, the wheels, with the runway is accomplished by adjusting rudder to match aircraft and runway heading and lowering the upwind wing with aileron. To avoid touching down sideways or in a crab, a pilot must learn the side slip or wing low method of landing. With the side slip method, the pilot flies a longer portion of the final approach in a slip and lands with the aircraft heading always aligned with the runway. If a pilot is unsure of the exact strength of crosswind or is not as comfortable with the aircraft, Establishing the side slip early will allow the pilot more time to adjust and establish the proper control inputs. Using this method causes an increase in drag and the pilot must have to adjust pitch and power settings to maintain the appropriate airspeeds and approach path. As the aircraft slows during the approach and round out, it will be critical to smoothly adjust and increase control deflection to accommodate for less control effectiveness at slower speeds. Now, combining the concepts of both the crab and side slip methods leads to the D-crab method. The D-crab method is really what the FAA defines as the crab method. This means that the final approach is flown in the crab, but then the pilot quickly adjusts rudder and aileron to align with the runway during the roundout right before touchdown. With this in mind, there really isn't any difference in the touchdown compared to the side slip method except for timing. Instructors at UND Aerospace generally recommend that students new to an aircraft leave themselves more time for adjustments by using the side slip method from at least short final until more experience is gained. During touchdown, if the pilot fails to completely align the longitudinal axis with the runway, meaning they land in a crab, or if they fail to correct for lateral drift, extreme side loads can be imposed on the landing gear. 
These side loads can increase the chances of loss of directional control and structural damage while landing. Ultimately, if these events occur, the effect on the aircraft is usually the same. As the wheels touch down, the downwind wheel resists the side load. As this occurs, inertia tries to tip the aircraft further downwind. With the crosswind acting on the fuselage and the wings, the aircraft is also yawing into the wind, causing further side load and drift. If the aircraft does touch down with a side load, the aircraft could bounce, lose directional control, or perhaps ground loop. While a go-around is advised, the pilot must gain and maintain directional control for a go-around to be successful. To do this, the pilot must apply aileron into the wind to lower the wing and rudder control to maintain directional control and regain runway alignment. Once the aircraft touches down, the task of a successful landing is still not complete. There are a number of situations that can quickly develop. The first of these related to the crosswind landing is the dreaded ground loop. The ground loop is an uncontrolled turn of the aircraft. This can happen any time that the aircraft is on the ground, but is usually associated with poor control after the landing roll. A ground loop starts with a swerve. The cause of this initial swerve could be careless use of rudder, uneven ground, or landing in a drift. Once the swerve starts, prompt and precise controls are required to prevent it from developing into a full ground loop. While tricycle-geared aircraft are less susceptible to ground looping than their conventional gear counterparts, it is still possible and it does still happen. Prevention is the key. Maintain alignment with the runway during touchdown and don't stop flying the plane until it's secured on the ramp or in a hangar. While the ground loop and landing in a drift or crab tend to be issues related to proper rudder usage, proper aileron control is also essential to successful crosswind landings. In fact, both of the previously mentioned hazards can be exacerbated or made worse if the upwind wing is allowed to rise after touchdown. What this hazard illustrates is pilot control use. It is common to relax once the aircraft is on the ground, however, relaxing crosswind corrections before the aircraft is stopped will lead to directional control issues. When an aircraft is on the ground in a crosswind condition, the upwind wing will experience greater force and angle of attack compared to the downwind wing. If left uncorrected during landings in a strong crosswind, it is possible for the upwind wing to raise high enough to cause the downwind wing to strike the ground. If this occurs, the pilot and aircraft are likely to depart from centerline, if not the side of the runway. To prevent this condition from lifting the wing against the pilot's will, remember to apply aileron correction into the wind during both takeoff and landing rolls. During the landing, it is important to note that this control application will increase as the aircraft slows down. This is especially critical in light general aviation aircraft. Any pilot must gain experience and develop good crosswind landing practices and techniques. The hazards associated with crosswind landing stem from improper directional control and follow-through procedures such as keeping the ailerons into the wind. Once a crosswind landing aligned with the runway is made, beware of directional control issues and allowing the upwind wing to rise. Regaining directional control depends upon pilot vigilance and appropriate control response. Crosswind landings pose a challenge, but with good execution, are extremely rewarding. All of us at UND Aerospace hope that you've enjoyed this entire Faulty Approaches and Landings series. Stay tuned for more original UND Aerocast training episodes, and as though you thought I wouldn't say it, have fun and fly safe.